Hi, I'm Noel Valeri. I just uh, want to do a little walkthrough of the film I just made in Unreal Engine 5. It's called Ride, and you may or may not have seen it yet, so go watch it if you haven't, so you have some context. I've been a creative person as long as I can remember. Uh, I started out with music back in grade school, and then kind of evolved into filmmaking when I started making uh, short films with my friends in high school, and then kind of evolved into a 11 year career in the visual effects industry. Worked on about 35-ish uh, movies and TV shows you may or may not have seen. UE5 caught my attention when I saw a lot of these uh, amazing images coming out of people working with it on YouTube. I knew who Epic Games were. I've known what Unreal Engine was since the 90s. Somebody booted it up, I remember, in my dorm room in Emerson College in Boston my sophomore year, and I said, what the hell is that? That's amazing. But, you know, it, it just kind of was in passing. Games weren't what I was getting into back then. I was more interested in making films. That's what I had started out doing. So it definitely piqued my interest. And when it came around again, I knew what they were talking about. As somebody who's a layout artist and a filmmaker, somebody who's found themselves more often than not inside of a 3D package, piloting a 3D camera around. Definitely was intrigued to see the real-time capabilities of the Unreal Engine and see how that could fit into a project that I made. So the story behind Ride is actually a very small snippet of a script I wrote back in 2007, 2008, around there. The inspiration behind this world that I've built is, you know, you might be wondering why there's no cars, why there's you no know, no people around. This is a major city. I used the Unreal Engine city sample that was made for the Matrix Awakens demo. You can download for free off of Epic Games Marketplace. Brought it into to Unreal. Of course, I initially brought it into a much older PC of mine and it was very, <laughs> struggling very hard to keep up. Since then I've upgraded and things are better. Using the city sample has been really nice. It kind of feels like sacrilege to go into this uh, amazing thing and just kind of lop off some of the, the systems that are in here, like the AI system that drives the traffic and all the NPCs, and I just kind of turn them all off because it wasn't really something I needed. If you're wondering about like what's going on, what what's actually happening, what the backstory is of this world, originally when I wrote this script, it was right after I had encountered images coming out of North Korea. It was something I was like, wow, this is a really bizarre environment. These freeways that are empty of cars, these streets that are completely empty, and the oppression that happens in that country of its people to the point where you're not allowed to own a car. Only government are very high up are allowed to have cars and everyone else has to have a bicycle. If you have a bicycle, you're actually pretty well off in North Korea. I thought that was a really fascinating setup for something that's, you know, a post apocalyptic, post-American kind of narrative, you know, you can kind of surmise that this kind of environment is in some ways like that desolation that I saw in those photos of North Korea. This whole thing is based in a fictional version of San Francisco. The Matrix City sample was something that I used to just stand in for that environment, and I worked really well. Add a few elements and tweak things a bit and make it the environment that I needed. This is my character, Andy J. He's named after a good friend of mine. He is a uh, metahuman from the metahuman creator that Epic Games has come up with in the last several years. He looks a little different because the lighting's different, but this is more or less the same character. He's kind of got blue eyes. He's kind of got, you know, this kind of amber, you know, kind of bleach job hair, some facial hair. It's more or less a character that doesn't really have a definable heritage. I've, I've just made a new iteration of Andy J, my character, and I'm gonna show you what you can do with this thing. It's kind of amazing. If you're already used to metahumans, just skip over this. This is just for, just to cover the whole backstory. This is Andy J as I've made him. This is the combination of different characters I've used. And then you can just, you can do whatever you want here. You can tweak the skin color, you make him darker skinned. You can make him, his face can have more or less texture or just different texture. He looks a little more, you know, rugged there. Maybe I'll take off some of the freckles and make him look a little bit less like a uh, you know, Westerner. And just kinda, you can just go wherever you want with this. So let me pick a different eye color. Let's pick different hair color and give him, you know, completely different hair, you know, give him a little more punk rock, get, get him some, get a more interesting beard shape. I mean, the possibilities are pretty endless with this creator. So you can, you know, you can come up with a pretty usable character in very, very, very little time. 
I think I maybe spent 25 minutes making him initially. And then I tweaked things along the way. Just, you know, as I looked at him actually in the environment, said, okay, well, his hair, you know, his hair was initially brown. I added the, the highlights and, you know, that kind of stuff. Metahumans are kind of a universal uh, rig and uh, setup inside of Unreal now. So you could bring in your own character very easily and kind of marry up the metahuman rig and the metahuman control rig and just make your own metahuman. It's not that hard. There's lots of tutorials online on how to do it. I just felt like I would use what I could out of the box to start anyway. But yeah, this is an amazing piece of software. Things like this just have not existed. The ability to make your own character and not be a character designer artist is really what attracted me to the somebody that looks like the character that's in my head. And I came out very quickly and I was able to like export him from here, jump back in the engine and have my character already made. So let's go back in the engine and I'll show you a little bit more about what I was working on. I'm about to enter the nuts and bolts part of this project. Just to warn you, this is very technical and you know, this is fully how the sausage was made, but I'm gonna take you through everything that I did to get this project out. How long did it take? Hard to say. I've gone through the timestamps of the files I was working on and backup logs. And it seems like to me, it took about four and a half months from the first time I opened Unreal Engine 5, never used it before, to when I put together the final render and uploaded it to YouTube in the current state that you can watch it, that was about four and a half months. So this is my alleyway scene that I had to pretty much create from scratch. Obviously the city I didn't build. I really kind of used it out of the box and modified it to fit my needs. I did a few tweaks. Um, obviously I got rid of the, the cars and the people. And then I added this Bay Bridge model, which was totally amazing. And if you haven't heard of Tav Shande, I believe his name is. I'm sorry if I'm not saying that correctly. I purchased this from the Unreal Marketplace and I could not believe the amount of detail. This is the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. This is a bridge that I've driven over probably a thousand times. If you sit on this bridge in traffic for a while, you definitely can, um, <laughs> you definitely get a uh, gist of what it looks like. And this is it. Like this guy who made this, this model is a genius. Like this is absolutely 100% an accurate version of this. And then, you know, the lower deck is the, this is the way you would go if you were going to Oakland. Um, so this pretty much, that's pretty, I've had many days going back to Oakland, kind of hung over and during the sunrise. And that's pretty much exactly what it looks like. <laughs> I can tell you for a fact. If you need a San Francisco Bay Bridge in your San Francisco scene, your, your short or feature that takes place in San Francisco or even your game, this is the one, this is amazing. So that was a no brainer. I wanted a really nice shot that you could fly through the suspension wires of the Bay Bridge because I always thought that would be a really cool shot. Being an actual you know, licensed drone operator or certified drone operator, I always wanted to get this shot, but I never really felt like it was really safe enough to do uh, with an actual drone on the actual Bay Bridge with traffic crossing under it. I know a lot of people on YouTube, other drone operators have been able to get that shot. I've never really thought that it was a good idea to cross over that traffic and then, you know, risk losing your drone. So it was nice actually to, to perform drone shots in Unreal Engine and not have to worry about all those logistics. While I'm up here, I'll show you some of the stuff that uh, I was able to do. So if you see these weird kind of planes, these this is a, a plugin called Easy Fog by William Fauscher. That guy's amazing. If you ever haven't checked out his videos on YouTube, he's he's a visual effects artist who kind of got into Unreal and is now that's kind of his thing. So if you you know are coming from that world, I highly recommend you check out his videos. But he made this plugin, and I think it's like nine dollars or something on the Unreal Marketplace, like criminally cheap. But it also means that everybody that I've talked to, uh, I was actually just at. Unreal Fest uh, a couple weeks ago, and a lot of people were like, oh yeah, Easy Fog, everybody uses that. It's all based on cards and uh, kind of moving alpha channels and textures, and it's, it's amazing. It was able to accurately reproduce the San Francisco fog, and I've definitely seen some foggy days having lived in San Francisco for as many years as I did. So I know all about what it actually looks like and how it behaves, and this kind of hit it out of the park. Unbelievable. Um, so I will fly down to my alleyway. So interesting thing about the city sample, and this isn't a diss at all, it's just funny. The funny thing was that this city is built with no alleys whatsoever. And that is a little strange. Maybe they thought about it and it just wasn't a high priority. Maybe it just would have made the procedural generation harder. But you've got all these city blocks that like the middle of the block is like this, you know, 
enclosed courtyard, which there's some cities that have that. Airwells in New York City, I know, you know, you know, uh, certain certain city blocks have this kind of enclosed feel. Certainly the place that I lived for the last 17 years uh, has has that kind of environment with no alleys in the middle of the block. But this scene took place in an alley. So I had to actually make an alley. And how did I do that? I went and deleted a building. I just said, oh, here's good. And I just clicked on it, deleted it, chucked it. So, I, and then I used um, some of the assets that come with the city sample. All these buildings are, you know, you can build these individually. They're all little pieces um, that you can find built into the project and just kind of create your own city and the environment that you need. So that was really nice to be able to do that. But I did, I guess it took me a couple days and you know, I, I added this, this is all just walls that I uh, pasted in there. I had to kind of come up with the solution coming up with an alley that looked like an alley. So like having windows down on the bottom level wasn't really going to work. So I had to delete a bunch of that stuff and re-add it. And then I added, I you know, copied and pasted some of these uh, fire escapes to make it look a little bit more like an alley in San Francisco. I had the best reference in the world. You know, being in San Francisco was great, but also I could just go into Google Maps and just do like a street view and kind of go down some of the alleys and kind of get inspiration for where I would do that. Primarily came from downtown and North Beach and those areas, if you know San Francisco, that's where I kind of got the ideas for um, how this would look. So also I had to add some of these, um, so these curbs didn't exist. I had to add all these in there, the curbs and the sidewalk, which was relatively easy, honestly. And then I added some chain link fence back here just to make it a little bit more gritty. And then I spent a while on the lighting, got the sun in the right position. I actually also looked at a bunch of street view pictures and also just in general Google photos that were available and, and just image search and looked and found a bunch of things reference that, you know, of, of a sunrise in San Francisco, see where the actual sun would be rising over the Embarcadero. If you've ever been to the Embarcadero in San Francisco, this is not what it looks like. If this is a really good stand in, but it is not. Not at all what, what it looks like. And the, the real Embarcadero curves uh, right around this point and it curves around and then it becomes King Street and then there's AT&T Park right there and then it kind of extends down further and goes to 3rd Street. But this is, this is not accurate. This is, you know, it's got this median here in the middle. In reality, there's a train line that runs around, right down the middle. I wasn't about to modify this and add a train line in. This area here underneath the Bay Bridge is very similar to what it looks like. I've actually seen a few concerts here. I used to park my car here. So I know this area pretty well. I believe it's Pier 28 or something like that. But it looks kind of like this. And then, you know, obviously this is not accurate because it runs right into the side of a building. It's not really a, uh, it's not an accurate representation, but you know. We filmmakers are cheaters. We're just looking to get the shot. And you know what? It works. Real quick, I'm gonna show you the detail in this, you know, beyond the Bay Bridge, which was incredible. The stuff that's even just built in to the to the city sample, these are very similar to mailboxes and fire hydrants that are in San Francisco. This over here, this is this is a San Francisco city trash can. Like I know what they look like. That's one of them. So the city sample I believe uses buildings from NYC Chicago and San Francisco kind of all mashed up together. You wouldn't see buildings like this anywhere in San Francisco. They don't, they just don't look like this. But then, you know, you've got these, these incredible parking meters. These are 100% San Francisco SFMTA parking meters. Like that is 100% what they look like, which I was like, yes, it was definitely, you know, it was fun to, to see things that were familiar and close to home. But I, what I ended up doing was there, these are all kind of bent over in here. I ended up just deleting all the parking meters off this street and then just putting it back in by hand. That's exactly what a street cleaning sign looks like in San Francisco. For all you San Francisco nerds out there, you'll appreciate this level of detail that I found in the city sample. Somebody who obviously is from here, obviously has visited here or just very familiar with, with San Francisco. So it was definitely a shoe in for this project. This street here is also very accurate as to what it would look like on a foggy morning. In San Francisco, I, you know, it's a time honored technique for filmmakers to wet the streets down just to make it pop a little bit more. So I can understand why they would do this in general, just have it, you know, have it kind of show off what the engine can do with reflections and things like that in real time. After a foggy day, like the fog just rolls in through the, through the Golden Gate and just blank, blankets everything and then recedes when the temperature rises and then 
you get left behind this kind of residual moisture. So I thought that was really cool. So the alley I pretty much built from scratch, but also these, you know, obviously these are all deliberately placed and all have some level of meaning, which I'll go through now. So if, if you don't know, this is the symbol for Run the Jewels, the, the music group, rap group, who are kind of like anti-establishment, one of my favorites. So I just thought that they, <laughs> the street art was appropriate to have them included. Help Me, I'm in Hell is a reference to Nine Inch Nails. It's the vibe of the story too, or the scenario here where he's kind of in hell. He's, he's, these characters are coming after him. This text is actually from Hellraiser. The original thing says, I am in hell, help me, from the first Hellraiser movie. That's pretty much where Nine Inch Nails got the idea from, but they just kind of inversed it. So that's what I did. Now it's a Nine Inch Nails reference. So this is kind of the music wall. Okay, so let me back up and I'm gonna show you some of these things. This is El Riesgo Siempre Vive. It is on the breastplate of one of my favorite characters from sci-fi, Vasquez from Aliens. And in that scene where they have the smart guns, She's got that huge gun and just big muscles, you know. I love that character so much. And it actually goes along really well with the other, the much larger mural, which is uh, actually Maya Darren, filmmaker from the 40s, who is pretty significant for her time. She, this is from a short film called Meshes of the Afternoon, which I completely adore, and something that I wanted to reference, you know, inside of my movie. Actually, the drone shot that's in the in the actual film was much longer, but it didn't flow very well. But it, you know, that shot originally had more of the mur mural in it, so you could see it. So now you can see it in, in its full glory. So that's where that came from. So that, you know, the, the phrase El Riesgo Siempre Vives, it's kind of roughly translated as fortune favors the bold. And Maya Darren was absolutely one of those revolutionary filmmakers who ins inspired filmmakers like David Lynch. So I thought, that was a good place for her to be. So we'll go out here real quick. This is street art actually for Massive Attack. So I, I actually got these from uh, the Heligoland uh, album cover. And I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a nod to Massive Attack and uh, Robert Del Naha, who is a you know 3D for Massive Attack, is actually a street artist. People have rumored that he's actually Banksy, but I don't think that's true. Um, maybe he is, I don't know. All right, let me open up one of these scenes here. Let's go, let's just go with the drone shot. So this is the drone shot. You see halfway through the, pretty much at the halfway mark in the middle of the film, where Andy J is trapped in this alleyway now. This this car that he saw in the distance is is blocking the alleyway, and there's these dark figures in the alley. They are characters called the Shadow Men. They they play a very big part in the uh, rest of the story. So this character's kind of been in my psyche since I was a little kid. I remember seeing, you know, lots of movies and TV shows about these dark figures that have no face kind of this cloaked figure. It's definitely equal parts Darth Vader and Freddy Krueger. Kind of this cultural psychological image. If you ever Google Shadow Man, which I hadn't done, I just came up with this character seemingly on my own, but it's part of like a cultural psyche that this this dark figure from the, our cinematic psyche maybe, you know, just kind of fear of the unknown, but I really wanted him to be, you know, trench coat, fedora, no face. So these are 100% designed to be intimidating. Anyway, so this is the conference. This is what I call the alley confrontation scene in the in the story. Coming up with shots. If I had just come into this into the engine and somebody had already set up this up for me, it'd be such a piece of cake to come up with a great shot. Say that I wasn't real happy with this shot and I just wanted something fresh. So I'll go. Okay, let's make a new camera. So I go in here in the sequencer and make a new camera, and then I can just tweak the focal length. Say, okay, I want something pretty. Pretty long lens, so I'll go with an 80. So yeah, that's, you know, that's more on the long lines. Maybe I wanted to do a dolly shot here. That would uh, start here and end here. So I'll just, you know, add a quick keyframe here and kind of go a little bit further and then, you know, pilot it over here. And then, so we've got, you know, instantly we've got a shot that kind of emulates that. If you want it longer, you can stretch it out. So I've got this shot like done, you know, how long is that? Like 28 seconds. <laughs> so this is why I really love working in this software. It just was something that I could get my ideas out very fast. Once the characters were made, once the scene was set up, I could just, just go. And then I would just duplicate each of the shots. So like say I'm in this shot, this is 16. I would duplicate this shot and then pilot the camera around the other side and I'd add animation, I would add those things in the sequencer and kind of progress from there. It's just such a, a way that you can rapidly convey a story. And as a filmmaker, 
there's nothing like this. Like this is just absolutely incredible that it's, you know, it's easy to come by. The assets are available. You can kind of kit bash them together and make something really fantastic very quickly. That's pretty much the environment. That's, that's as far as I had to go with it. To, to get something amazing. Being able to create something that even just to stand in for San Francisco is really fun to be able to make an environment that felt like I was standing there on Embarcadero and to be able to, you know, shut down the street for four months and, and come up with this, you know? Make sure that it, it came out right. Didn't have to direct anybody, you know, and didn't have to direct any actors. Not to say that it's a bad thing. I love working with people, but take the vision and refine it, drop it into this real-time environment that I didn't know anything about. I'm, obviously, I'm pretty skilled with 3D software, having used it for so many years professionally, but I was definitely like, I'm going to give this a shot, and it did not disappoint. If you haven't used Unreal Engine 5 or Unreal Engine at all, you'll definitely realize very quickly that there's multiple ways to light a scene, more importantly, get the look and feel of the film that you want to in real time. Things that I tweaked that made me really happy that I had the option to do so. Getting an accurate depth of field based on your camera lens, your, your um, aperture, your focus distance. I mean, you could just change the focus distance on the fly. They've got this handy dandy little plane here. Um, your focus plane where you can kind of change the, uh, the distance and see where especially with a really shallow depth of field where you can get a really accurate focus. So it's really just right in the middle of his face. The cinematic camera in Unreal is really fun to use. It's just, um, you know, just being able to pile it around very easily and frame things up and animate it. And then also all the cinematic um, controls, all the um, film back, you can pick your lens, you can choose zoom or a prime lens, very robust set of tools um, for you as a filmmaker. Another thing is the post-process volume. That is something that I did not know existed coming into Unreal, and I was very happy to see, you know, I was like, oh, why do you need something separate from the camera to define what it looks like? You know, you should be able to light it, use your camera, but you just really have to get into the mode of understanding what it is. It's this whole other stylistic element that is separate from the camera, which actually is more flexible, and with animatable attributes, things like that. You've got bloom, uh, lens bloom, which is kind of like filter. Exposure changes pretty easily. Chromatic aberration, grain. This is where it's all done. So I was able to get some really cool looking stuff. So if I turn off the post-process volume right now, you can kind of see what it does. So now I've got a harsher um, shadow here. It's much more detailed, but it looks less filmic. So I wanted to use the PPV to get me a little more of that film kind of look. I did do some color correction or final grading at the end in Premiere when I worked on this, but I just wanted to show you what this actually did. People get made fun of for uh, using Bloom too much because it kind of has this uh, kind of dreamy quality, like kind of those old filters from the, the 80s or 90s where it just makes it look kind of cheesy. But I used a pretty significant Bloom in my short just to make the colors kind of glow a little bit more and then knocked it back a little bit in uh, in color grade. I want to scroll down here and show you what the film grain does. There's also vignette, which I used. It makes it look a little more cinematic. And then I introduced some significant grain. Let's do like five, you know, like that's pretty ridiculous, but I think I had 1.25 was what I did. So it looks noisy, but it's cool. So just having that kind of control is really kind of rad as a filmmaker to be like, you don't have to do it in post. You don't have to do, composite it later. It's kind of amazing <laughs> to have it right in engine like that. You almost could do the entire project in engine. In fact, I know people do. I did a little bit of tweaks in Premiere and After Effects and a few composites. So this made it a little bit easier of a process and it, it saved me some time. So now I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to open up MetaHuman Animator. I did a much lighter scene for testing mocap, specifically for getting the facial motion capture. So I'm an Android Windows guy in general. I used to have a MacBook Pro, which I loved for years, but I don't have any Apple products. So I actually had to go on you know, eBay and buy a iPhone 12 mini to get this even done. But you know, the cost of a couple hundred dollars, uh, you know, insignificant for the, the amount of technological power that this provides. And I'm going to jump into MetaHuman Animator to show you these performances and what I used and how it how it works. This is the final line in the film. What do you assholes want? When uh, Andy J is confronted by these shadow characters, this is the um, take that I actually used here. That's uh, highlighted in the timeline. I'm going to expand it a little bit so you can see a little bit more. Um, 
of the other takes that I did. So this is kind of like a, a rough representation of my face, which doesn't really look like my face, but it's, it's close enough as far as capturing and putting it onto a metahuman was concerned. So putting it onto a metahuman just means that I baked out the animation from the performance, which was, this is from the iPhone. This is what I was just showing you. Like you can see, it's getting most of the performance here. So it's getting, even with my head tilt down, you know, getting the squinty eye thing. And this is just amazing that this exists and it's free. It's an app that's free on iPhone. And this is what they used in Avatar more or less to get, you know, all the facial capture put onto animated characters and get that kind of nuance of acting. Obviously their equipment's a lot more expensive than a $300 uh, secondhand iPhone, but this is pretty incredible that you can do this. It's funny because this, you know, you can't actually see how accurate this is, but if you watch the film, you can see that it really did get all of this, this eye motion, all of this facial animation. So I'm very glad I upgraded to 5.2.1 before the end of the project so I could get this in there because the facial animation I had done before was like, all right, but this is just something else. This is another world. I tried a lot of free software that was out there. Different companies had different ways of doing it. I tried the live link thing before MetaHuman Animator existed. Um, just with a webcam, variable success. Having come from a background of tracking objects in 3D space, specifically facial, you know, very detailed facial capture in the early 2000s was mostly manual. Obviously this is very automated. Originally back when I worked on the Matrix movies, they worked on something called UCAP and that's how they got the performances onto Agent Smith and Neo's faces in those things where they had like an array of 3D cameras around a face and they were pretty much standing still and having to make these facial expressions, which then they transferred on. That was like 2000, 2001 that technology was. And now, you know, it's funny that a lot of the same people that worked on that actually are responsible for this. And, you know, the digital human thing has evolved quite a bit since the Matrix uh, sequels. 20 years later, now you can do it on your iPhone. You don't need five, you know, HD cameras and Hollywood caliber actors, obviously. Um, so yeah, this is where I did it. Mostly automated. Obviously, I chose the takes of the ones I liked the most and tried out a bunch of different ones. I, t I think I had about five or six different takes of each of the uh, lines that I tried out and tried in the scene and saw which one worked the best. And the one that's in there is the one that worked the best. I also did, I, not with this shot, but other shots, I would do some modifications, add an additive animation on the bottom and kind of just, you know, change the, um, the eye line or change the uh, eyebrows or something like that. So I did do a little bit of tweaking on some of the shots, not this one though. This is pretty much out of the box. Anyway, I hope you like this behind the scenes. Uh, I've enjoyed going through it with you. I definitely want to stop and say at the end here that I don't know what I would have done without the YouTube community surrounding uh, Unreal Engine 5. Like they've been so helpful and very generous with all this information of how to learn this very complex, potentially daunting software package. No lack of issues that I had learning it, but definitely like very quick turnaround as far as uh, this isn't working. How do, what do I do? You know, forums, Facebook groups, everything surrounding the engine is just so supportive. And if you want to do this as a filmmaker or as a game designer or whatever you want to do with the engine, I know people do a lot of really interesting things. I would very much encourage you to use this. As far as things that I ran into, little technical problems, in separate videos, I'm going to do little snippets of uh, problems that I kind of encountered that you may have also encountered. Things that would have been helpful to me. I had to dig in the weeds for a few things. And since I got so much benefit from so many free YouTube accounts out there, I think it's only appropriate that I give back to the community that helped me. I'm looking forward to the next project. You know, reach out and, and show me what you've made. It, it, I'm always excited to see, you know, anybody's ideas that might come out from, from using this and, you know, having such an amazing creative tool at your fingertips. Anyway, thanks so much. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.